Well, shalom, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Clouds of Torah presents um, the judges and saviors of Israel. So before I get into the lesson, I want to do a, a, a contrast of what the average person, and when I say average person I'm speaking for America, of course, I've not lived anywhere else. And the average person in America is raised Christian and their idea of salvation is completely different than the Tanakh. So the first thing I want to do is I want to touch on the inconsistent salvation doctrine of the New Testament. So when we open up the book, the first book in the New Testament, Matthew 121, it says, and she, bring, she shall bring forth the son and thou shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Now we know that's complete problem dealing with Isaiah 714. We have lessons on that. I have a lesson on the TV about the false doctrine of the virgin birth. That's not what we're talking about right now. But we're talking about the verse that says, he shall save his people from their sins. Well, in the New Testament, nobody got saved from their sins. Everybody still died. Um, what, what does that even mean, saved from their sins? Does that mean they, they weren't able to sin again? It really doesn't clarify that. So when you go further, in Luke 23 and 34, it says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, I thought that's what you were supposed to do. Wasn't you supposed to come to die for everybody and save them from their sins, according to Matthew? Why are you asking God to forgive them? Is it because they didn't believe in you? And if God did forgive them for their sins, then why was Jerusalem destroyed? Like, I mean, there's there's no consistency of what is the concept of salvation so far. So when you go into the book of Hebrews, it says, and by the law, almost all things are purged with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We know this is the hardcore Christian doctrine of the, the blood of Jesus is the only way to life and all these things. Well, it says Almost all things are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So now we got a problem. If almost our things are purged with blood, then that means there is another way. Or that word almost doesn't mean almost. So if we go to Mark 1 and 4, it says, John baptized in the wilderness and preached baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. There was no blood in those baptisms. People came to John, they got baptized, and either they were forgiven of sins or they weren't. So did John's baptism work because there was no blood involved? I'm not sure the writer of Hebrews read Mark 1 and 4. Matthew 9 and 2, and behold, they brought to him a man sick with the palsy, lying on the bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the one sick with palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Where was the blood? There's no, there's no remission of sin there. Because there's no blood poured out, according to the book of Hebrews. So this doctrine is not consistent. And let's say this man's sins were forgiven for argument's sake. Did he still die? And it doesn't even say he even believed in Jesus. <laughs> it says the people around them had faith because he's got this palsy. So th th there's no consistent doctrine of what's going on with the salvation here. So if he can forgive people without dying and shedding blood, what was the point of him dying anyway? Why he didn't he just forgive Israel? Since he could forgive this person, everybody's good. He keeps living. He doesn't have to die. He should become the Messiah. Close the book. What's going on? Now, <laughs> Peter is, of course, you know, I will build my church upon Peter, right? On the rock. First Peter 4 and 8 says, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Well, how about that? Isn't that what it says in Proverbs 10, verse 2? Where's the blood? And what's the point of Jesus dying if I can just give some charity to get some sins covered? This, this, this doctrine is just, it's a roller coaster. John 20 and 23 if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are re refrained. I mean, sorry, retained. So if Jesus has given his disciples the power to forgive sins, what was the point of his death? He didn't have to die if he can just tell them, oh, yep, you can forgive sins too. 
And these people who read these books, they're not holding these things all in, under, under the same weight. That's why the Torah says you got to have just weights and measures. Because some don't believe Peter. Some don't believe John. Some don't believe Paul. So, you know, so it's, there's really no consistency going on here. So if, is blood the only way, according to the book of Hebrews? Well, not according to Jesus in Matthew 9. And if disciples can, you know, forgive sins, if charity can get your sins forgiven, then the whole concept of blood and him dying for you is out the window. So now we're going to get into the real part problem with the salvation doctrine, with the inconsistent salvation doctrine of the New Testament out of Jesus's mouth, Matthew 10, 22 through 23. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So does that mean if I don't make it to the end, I won't be saved? Because when is the end, right? Nobody knows the end. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, this is a promise. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, that's a false prophecy. Because we know they went and preached around the cities of Israel before the temple was destroyed. It doesn't take 40 years for those disciples to go around preaching. And we know Paul says in Colossians, the, the, uh, the gospel was preached throughout the whole world, Colossians 1.23. So if the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven, he should have came back according to Matthew 10, 22 through 23. Matthew 23 and 34. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. What type of salvation are you preaching when you're telling the people they're going to die? That's not salvation. That's almost guaranteeing their death on your behalf. Matthew 24 and 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by, by all nations for my name's sake. He's telling you flat out, they're going to kill you because of me. But I thought you were here to save the people. That's completely the opposite doctrine. Did you not read Matthew? Of course, he didn't read Matthew. I'm making jokes, but you, he should have known what his job was. And that's not his job to tell people that they're going to die. We're not expecting the, the, the Messiah to come and tell us, oh, yeah, um, I, I'll reform the United Nations. But, but by the way, guys, you're going to have to get killed first. And then I'm going to save the world. <laughs> like That doesn't make any sense. John 17, 15. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keepeth them from evil. So here we got a prayer from Jesus to God. Uh, unless he's, you know, if you're a Trinitarian, he's praying to himself that he should keep the disciples from evil. Well, why would you make that prayer if you just guarantee that they're going to die for your namesake in Matthew 24 and 9? That doesn't make any sense. Acts 12, 1 through 2. Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So that's consistent when Jesus said that you're going to die. But what about he's praying to God that they should be kept from evil? Did that prayer not work? Did God not listen to his beloved son, according to the New Testament? What happened? Acts 26, 9 through 10. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Why is Paul able to kill people? Because Jesus said you're going to die, right? Well, where's the salvation at? Where's the praying to keep them from evil at? What happened? That's, that's not a consistent story. Now, still, since we're talking about Paul, I'm going to show you the contradiction. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10. For they themselves show us of what manner of entering in, 
I'm sorry, let me start that again. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. So he saved you from something that hasn't happened yet, right? He delivered us from the wrath to come. So there's some type of wrath that's going to come. Well, if this was before the temple was destroyed, nobody got saved from that. We know all the church fathers teach that the disciples were all martyred and killed, hung upside down and all types of things. We just read in Acts how Herod was harassing the church and killing people. Revelations 20 and 4, and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus. How did he deliver you from the wrath to come if you getting beheaded for him? Where's the salvation at? So we see through all these passages, there is not, nothing consistent. You're going to die. He's praying that you get protected from evil. You're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. People still dying. There's the blood doctrine. You only, need, you only need the blood of Jesus to be saved. But there's instances where people are forgiven for their sins without blood. Is just all over the place. So now let's get into the real saviors in the Tanakh. And it's a completely different story. And it's, it makes so much sense. And it's so relevant to what the word salvation means in the context of how the Tanakh shows it from Noah, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. Joshua 2 10 through 13. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So the Gentiles are telling Joshua, we saw what God did. We know y'all got saved because we heard what y'all did to the Egyptians. We heard what y'all did to these two giants. Like we are, we are aware of this. This is not a believe. We know, and we're scared, right? And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So they recognize God <laughs> because they know who they're dealing with. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. That's salvation. That's a situation of a war about to come. Their lives are in danger and they're asking Joshua or the, 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 um, the two spies, save us. I saved y'all. I hid y'all. So you, you should be able to, you know, return this favor to me. That's true salvation because we know what happened, right? Judges 2, 13 through 16. I didn't spend too much time on Joshua because we know Joshua entered the land and, you know, um, the inconsistencies, inconsistencies with Israel is throughout the Tanakh, but I just wanted to show that one point of the salvation being physical in the time of need. And it was during the time of war and that actually took place. So if we go into the book of Judges, which is full of saviors, by the way, if you ever want to talk to a Christian and show them saviors in the Tanakh, all you got to do is read Judges. It's, it's covered in the saviors. Judges 2, 13 through 16. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around. So they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. So here goes this word delivered. Remember, this can mean snatch away, to rescue, to save. Most translations say deliver. A lot of them say save. So he saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. This is salvation. They were get, taking 
taken captive by all their enemies. It says the Lord put them in their in the hands of their enemies. They can no longer stand before their enemies. And he, 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 sent, he sent them saviors who saved them. But when, notice he gave them judges. So in Judges 2, 18 through 19, it says when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of the enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of all those who pressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and to bow to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So he sent somebody to judge them. We know Moses was a judge. He said, he said I said day and night and I judge the people that come to me to where he had to, you know, go to Jethro and get some advice on how to deal with this. And this is the problem. It says in the book of Proverbs, it says, when there is no revelation, he who keeps the law is happy. So right now, we don't have a overseeing like prophet or nothing like that. We do have judges. We have bait deans. We have, we have rabbis we can go to for rulings, but we don't have somebody with the authority over all Israel in the land. We know it's secular overall, but the world doesn't see these people as judges over them. They just see, oh, you're a rabbi of the Jews. So nobody's going to really listen to that. But Israel was under the hand of this judge. And it says the Lord was with that judge until he died. As soon as he died, Israel went back to their ways. So when this what happened, what the, the average, the, on, on, on the average um, terms, they would, they would be taken captive in their own land. They would be serving these people for years at a time. They would cry to God, and then he would send them another savior. And of course, he got tired of doing that. But we'll get to that later. We'll talk about that another time. So in Judges 3, 7 through 11, so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a savior or a deliverer from the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. We know Caleb from the Exodus story, and you know he's in the Torah. The spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. So technically, it doesn't call him a messiah. But if the spirit of the Lord came upon you, and we know it says the Lord was with all the judges, right? And he saved, it says, who delivered them. The Lord raised up a deliverer, for, the, the, a deliverer from the children of Israel who delivered them. He didn't show up and preach to them and tell them that they're going to die, that they're going to be killed for his name. He actually saved them from this king of Mesopotamia. It says the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war. And the, the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. What do we see here? We see Israel cry. They got salvation physically from a king after being served, servants to this king for eight years. If we contrast that with the New Testament, they were in their own land, serving the Romans. A so-called savior showed up. Nothing changed. And then they still got killed after he left. They were getting crucified before, and they were crucified and were killed afterwards. This is, the whole, this is why Bar Kokhba had to rise up and try his hand at saving Israel, which eventually failed. And this is one of the reasons people thought he was the Messiah, because he actually went to war. Now, remember in the New Testament, Peter had a sword, but what did Jesus tell him? If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Well, that's not what the Tanakh te the, the, the Tanakh does not teach that. David was a warrior. David lived by the sword. David didn't die in a war. So that, that whole concept of a Messiah showing up, telling people to put your sword up when you're in the hand of your enemies is not a, a, a salvation concept you're going to find in the Tanakh. They fought. Israel is a warrior people. 
Judges 3, 1 through 15. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, Judges 3 and 31. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox gold, and he also delivered Israel. So we see Savior after Savior after Savior in a time of war, physical salvation every time, not a word about saving people from their sins, not a word about they had to give a sacrifice, they had to pray in this guy's name, they had to do all these new commandments or whatever, none of that. They cried to the Most High, and he sent them a Savior. That's pretty much the, the, the theme of what's going on in the Tanakh. So the word for deliver, like I brought up before, is save, help, preserve from 3467 in the Strong's Concordance. This word is Yasha. So in Judges 8 and 22 through 23, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So this teaches us that, that saviors are not the end game. Just because a, a Messiah was to show up and save people from the hand of their enemies, they're not to be the, the new God. Gideon, he didn't want none of it. He says, God should rule over you. I don't, I don't, want, that. I don't want that position. Y'all put me on a whole nother level. That's, that's not what I was here to do. So I didn't want to go through every single one in the, in the book of Judges. Um, we just see the consistency. I wanted to start with the old te- or the New Testament to show you what we're what we, what we get walked through <laughs> from Matthew all the way through Revelation is just an inconsistent roller coaster of how do you get salvation? Is it blood? Is it no blood? Am I forgiven of my sins? What does that even mean? Am I still going to die? You know, what do I have to do to get it? You know, it, it's just inconsistent. And when we go through the Book of Judges, it's clear crystal clear. A war breaks out. They cry to the Lord. He sends them a savior. They get saved. Then, of course, they go back to their nonsense. So that's pretty much all I had as far as the, uh, the book of uh, uh, Joshua and the book of Judges. Um, we can open it up for qu- questions and, and, and deal with this, uh, these inconsistencies and the consistencies of the Tanakh, Inc- the inconsistencies of the New Testament and the consistencies of the Tanakh.